gladly attend you. Then don't, my daughter-in-law, stay where you are. Why must you go in such a hurry? Because I can't endure your carryings on. You do the opposite of my instructions. You have no respect for anything. If you're a servant, wench, and much too free with your advice. But you're a fool, my boy. I've said a hundred times to my poor son, your father, that you'd never come to good. I think you- Oh, dearie me, his little sister, all demure, is still water, though. You know the proverb. But mother and You ought to set a good example for him. Their dear departed mother did much better. But madame, after all- Sir, as for you, the lady's brother, I esteem you highly, but if I were in my son's, her husband's place, I urgently entreat you not to come within our doors. You preach a way of the living that decent people cannot tolerate. Mr. Tartuffe, your friend is mighty lucky. He is a holy man. I can't endure to hear you attack him. And shall we let a bigot critic caster come and usurp a tyrant's power here? And shall we never dare to amuse ourselves till this fine gentleman deigns to consent? If we must hark to him, there's not a thing we do, but what's a crime? He censures everything. He wants to guide you on the way to heaven. He's nothing but a hypocrite. You hate him and reject him because he tells Holmes truth to all of you. Daughter, goodbye. Not one word more. As for this house, I shan't soon set foot in it again. I won't escort her down, for fear she might fall foul of me again. How she seems possessed with her tartuffe. Her case is nothing, though, beside her son's. He is besotted with this tartuffe. Calls him brother and loves him a hundred times as much as mother, son, daughter, and wife. The fellow knows his dupe and makes the most aunt, and blinds him with a hundred masks of virtue, and gets money from him all the time by canting, and takes it upon himself to carpet us. The wretch the other day? Tore up a kerchief that he had found, calling it a horrid crime for us to mingle the devil's finery with holy things. You're very lucky to have missed the speech she gave us at the door. I see my husband is home. He hasn't seen me yet, so I'll go up and wait for his arrival. I will wait him here. I'll merely say good morning and be gone. I wish you'd say a word to him about my sister's marriage. I suspect Tartu proposes it. He's coming. Ah, good morning, brother. Dorian, has everything gone well these last two days? What's happening and how is everybody? Madame had fever and a splitting headache day before yesterday, all day and evening. And how about Tartuffe? Tartuffe? He's mighty well. Stout, fair, rosy-lipped. Poor man. At evening she had nausea and couldn't touch a single thing for supper. And how about Tartuffe? He unctuously ate two partridges as well as half a leg of mutton, deviled. Poor man. At last she let us all persuade her and got up the courage to be bled. And how about Tartuffe? To replace the blood that she had lost, he drank four huge drafts of wine. Poor man. So now they are both doing well, and I'll go straightway to inform my mistress how pleased you are at her recovery. Brother, she ridicules you to your face, and I must tell you candidly, she's quite right. Brother, you do not know the man you're speaking of. His converse has transformed me quite. He weans my heart from every friendship, teaches me to have no love for anything on earth, and I could see my brother, children, mother, and wife all die and never care a snap. Your feelings are humane, I must say. If you had seen him as I saw him first, you would have loved him just as much as I. He came to church each day, kneeled on both knees, right opposite my place, and drew the eyes of all the congregation. He humbly kissed the earth at every moment, and when I left the church, he ran before me to give me holy water at the door. I learned his poverty and who he was, and gave him gifts, but in his modesty he'd always wanted to return a part. It is too much, he'd say, too much by half. At length, heaven bade me take him to my home, and since then, all seems to prosper here. He censures everything, and for my own sake, he even takes great interest in my wife. He lets me know who ogles her, and seems six times as jealous as I am myself. What are you driving at with all this nonsense? Brother, your language smacks of atheism. That is the usual strain of all your kind. They must have everyone as blind as they. They call you atheists if you have good eyes, and if you don't adore their vain grimaces, you've neither faith nor care for sacred things. Have you quite done? Yes. I am your humble servant. Just a word. We'll drop that other subject. But you know Valerius had the promise of your daughter? Yes. You had named the happy day? Tis true. Then why put off the celebration of it? 
I can't say. I hope no obstacle can keep you from performing what you've promised. I shall do the will of heaven. Come, be serious. You've given your promise to Valère. Now will you keep it? Goodbye. His love, methinks, has much to fear. I must let him know what's happening here. Now, Marianne? Yes, Father? In you, I've always found a daughter dutiful and gentle, so I've always loved you dearly. I'm grateful for your fatherly affection. Well spoken. Now prove you deserve it by doing as I wish in all respects. To do so is the height of my ambition. Excellent. Well, what say you of Tartuffe? I'll say of him anything you please. Say then, my dear, that he has won your heart and you would like to have him become your husband. Please, what did you say? What? Surely I mistook you, sir. How now? Who is it, father, you would have me say has won my heart and I would like to have become my husband? Tartuffe. But, father, why should you make me tell this dreadful lie? Because I mean to have it be the truth. I'm resolved to graft Tartuffe into my family, so he must be your husband. What? Is the thing incredible? So much so, sir, I don't believe it, not even from yourself. There, there, don't take your father seriously, he's fooling! You hark me! You've taken on yourself here in this house a sort of free familiarity that I don't like! Let's not get angry, sir, I beg you, but are you making game of everybody? Your daughter is not cut out for bigot's meat. Besides, what can you gain by this match? How can a man of wealth, like yourself, go and choose a wretched vagabond for son-in-law? Hold your tongue, the less he has, the more cause have we to honor him. For he's let himself be robbed of all through careless disregard of temporal things and fixed attachment to the things eternal. Yes, so he says himself. Daughter, we cannot waste time upon this nonsense. True, I have promised you to young Valet, <laughs> but I fear his faith is not quite sound. I haven't noticed that he's regular at church. You'd have him run there just when you do, like those who go on purpose just to be seen. Hold your tongue. Don't poke your nose into other people's business. If I make bold searches for your own good, I can't endure to see you made the butt of all men's ridicule. Won't you be still? To be a sin to let you make this match. Won't you be still, I say, you impudent viper! What? You're pious and you lose your temper? I'm all on top with this confounded nonsense! Now once for all I say, hold your tongue! As a wise father, I've considered with all due deliberation, though he's no ladies' man, Tartuffe is well enough. Were I in her place, any man should rue it who married me by force, that's mighty certain. So, nothing I say has any weight. What's wrong now? I didn't speak to you. What were you doing? Talking to myself. Now, Marianne, obedience is the word, and you must accept my choice with reverence. You'd never catch me marrying such a creature. Daughter, I cannot discuss things in the state of mind I'm in. I'm all flustered by her insolent talk. To calm myself, I must go take a walk. You lost your tongue from out your head. What can I do? My father is the master. Valère has asked for your hand. Now, do you love him or do you not? You know how ardently I love him. And you both alike are eager to be well married to each other? Surely. Then what is your plan for this other match? To kill myself if it is forced upon me. Good. That's a remedy I hadn't thought of. Just die and everything will be all right. You have no sympathy for people's troubles. I have no sympathy for folk who talk nonsense. <laughs> Am I not constant in my love for him? Is it not his place to win me from my father? Yes, but if your father is a crazy fool and quite bewitched with his tartuffe and breaks his bounded word, is that your lover's fault? But shall I publicly refuse and scorn this match and make it plain I'm in love? Shall I cast off womanly modesty and filial duty? You ask me to display my love in public? No, no, I ask you nothing. You shall be Mr. Tartuffe's. Why, now I think of it, I'm wrong to turn you from this marriage. Mr. Tartuffe sure is not a man to sneeze at. 
Oh, I beg you. Try to find some way to help break off the match. I quite give in. I'm ready to do anything you say. A daughter must obey her father, even if he should want to wed her to a monkey. Oh, you'll kill me. Please, contrive to help me out with your advice. No, you shall be tartupified. <sighs> well, then, since you've no pity for my fate, there's one sheer cure I know for all my troubles. We'll find some way to hinder this, but here's the lamp. Madam, a piece of news, quite new to me, has just come out. What piece of news? Your marriage with Tartuffe. Tis true, my father has this plan in mind. And what's your resolution in this matter? What do you advise? I? My advice is, marry him, by all means. Do you mean it? Surely. Oh, very well then. I shall take your counsel. You'll find no trouble taking it, I warrant. No more than needed giving it, be sure. So, that is your love? And it was all deceit when you- You told me squarely, sir, I should accept the husband that has offered me. And I will tell you squarely that I mean to do so, since you have given me this good advice. I shall go at once. Oh, very well then. But remember this. T'was you that drove me to this desperate pass. Of course. Enough. You shall be punctually obeyed. So much the better. This is once for all. So be it then. Huh? What? You didn't call me? I? You were dreaming. Very well. I'm gone. Madam? Farewell. Farewell, sir. Just take both of you, I say. Now stop your fooling. Come here, you. And you. Didn't he hear the thing she said to me? Didn't you see the way he treated me? Fools, both of you. She thinks of nothing else but to keep faith with you, and he loves none but you. I stake my life on You'll have to find some other way to stave off this plaguey marriage. Then tell us how to go about it. We'll try all sorts of ways. They cannot marry you to anyone without you saying yes, but Nami thinks they mustn't catch you two chattering. You go and set your friends to work to make him keep his word to you while we will get the brother's influence to bear and the stepmother on our side too. Whatever efforts we may make, my greatest hope be sure must rest on you. I cannot answer for my father's whims, but no one save Valer shall ever have me. Go! Strike me down this very instant if I don't straight away do something desperate. I beg you, moderate this towering passion. No! I must end this poultry fellow's plot, and he shall hear from me a truth or two. Go slow now, and leave the fellow in your stepmother's hands. She has some way with this tartuffe. He's coming, Pike. What do you want with me? Madame will be down soon, and begs the favor of a word with you. Ah. Willingly. Will she come soon? Yes, I think I hear her now. Yes, here she is. I'll leave you with her. May heaven's overflowing kindness ever give you good health of body and of soul. I'm very grateful for your pious wishes, but let us sit down so that we may talk at ease. And how are you recovered from your illness? Quite well. The fever soon let go its hold. My prayers, I fear, have not sufficient merit to have drawn down this favor from on high. But each entreaty that I made to heaven had for its object your recovery. You're too solicitous on my behalf. I do far less for you than you deserve. There is a matter that I wish to speak of in private. Madame, I am overjoyed. Tis sweet to find myself alone with you. 
This is an opportunity I've asked of heaven many a time, till now in vain. What is your hand doing there? Feeling your gown. The stuff is very soft. Yes, true, but let us come to business. They say my husband means to break his word and marry Mary Ann to you. Is it so? He did hint at such things, but madame, that is not the happiness I'm yearning after. You mean you cannot love terrestrial things? Love for the beauty of eternal things cannot destroy our love for earthly beauty. Our mortal senses well may be entranced by perfect works that heaven has fashioned here. I could not look on you, the perfect creature, without admiring nature's great creator, and feeling all my heart inflamed with love for you, his fairest image of himself. I know such words seem strange coming from me, but madame, I'm no angel after all. If you condemn my frankly made avowal, you've only your charming self to blame. But if you will look down with gracious favor upon the sorrows of your worthless slave, I'll ever pay you, O oh, sweet miracle and unexampled worship and devotion. With me you need not fear a public scandal. Men like me are so discreet in love that you may trust their lasting secrecy. So, that you may find in hearts like ours sincere, love without scandal, pleasure without fear. Some women might do otherwise, but I am willing to employ discretion in repeating the matter to my husband. But in return, I'll ask one thing of you, that you urge forward frankly and sincerely the marriage of Valère to Marianne. No, I say! <laughs> this thing must be made public! I was just there and overheard it all. No, no, it is enough if he reforms. To spare him now would be a mockery. The rascal all too long has ruled my father and crossed my sister's love. The traitor now must be a mass before him. Father. We have news to welcome your arrival. This fine gentleman rewards your love most handsomely. I have just surprised him making to your wife the shameful offer of a guilty love. She, somewhat gentle and discreet, insisted that the thing should be concealed. But I will not condone such shamelessness. Yes, I believe a wife should never trouble her husband's ear with such petty gossip. A woman's honor does not hang on telling. It is enough if she defend herself. Just heaven, can what I hear be credited? Yes, brother, I am wicked, I am guilty, the greatest criminal who ever lived. Whatever wrong they find to charge me with, I'll not deny it. Believe their stories, arm your wrath against me, and drive me like a villain from your house. You miscreant! Can you dare with such a falsehood try to stain the whiteness of his virtue? What? The meekness of this hypocrite! Silence, curse play! Ah, let him speak. You chide him wrongfully. How can you know of what I am capable? Though all men believe me godly, the simple truth is I am a worthless creature. Ah, brother, tis too much! His talk is so deceit! Another you. word and I'll break your every bone! Stop! Upon my knees I beg you pardon him! Alas, how can you? Villain, behold his goodness! What? I know your motives for this attack. You hate him. All of you, you have every recourse for this shameful trick to drive this godly man from my house. The more you strive to rid yourselves of him, the more I'll strive to make him stay with me. I'll have him straightway married to my daughter, just to confound the pride of all of you. And will you force her to take his hand? Yes, and in this very evening. I am the master and must be obeyed. Now down upon your knees this instant rogue and take back what you said and ask his pardon. Ask his pardon of that cheating scoundrel. Do you resist your beggar and insult him? Out! Leave my house this instant, and never dare set foot in it again, you reprobate. I disinherit you, and leave you to my curse into the bargain! What? So insult a saintly man of God. Heaven, forgive him the pain he gives me. Brother, let us end these painful quarrels. I see what troublous times I bring upon you, and... Think tis needful I leave this house. No, you shall stay with me. My life depends upon it. Very well, but I shall rule my conduct to fit the case. Honor is delicate, 
and friendship binds me to forestall suspicion, prevent all scandal, and avoid your wife. No, you shall haunt her, just to confound the pride of all of them. Uh, you shall be seen at all hours together, and what is more, the better to defy them, I'll have no other heir but you. I'll go straightway make a deed of gift to you, drawn in due form of all my property. You will accept my offer, will you not? Heaven's will be done in everything. We'll go make haste to draw the deed aright, and then let envy burst itself with spite. become the talk of all the town and makes a stir that's scarcely to your credit. Suppose Dami acted the traitor and accused you falsely. Should not a Christian pardon this offense? Alas, so far as I'm concerned, how gladly would I do so? I bear him no ill will, but heaven's interests cannot allow it. Does heaven need our help to punish sinners? Leave to itself the care of its own vengeance and keep in mind the pardon it commands us. I forgive him, and that is doing, sir, as heaven commands. But after this day's scandal and affront, heaven does not order me to live with him. And does it order you to accept the gift of his estates? No one who knows me, sir, can have the thought that I am acting from a selfish motive. The goods of this world have no charm for me. And if I bring myself to take the gift which he insists on giving me, I do so to tell the truth. Only because I fear those to whom it may come will not employ it, as is my design, for heaven's glory and my neighbor's good. If heaven has made it quite impossible that you and Dami should live together here, were it not better that you should quietly and honorably withdraw than let the sun be driven out for your sake? Sir, it's half past three. Certain devotions recall me to my closet. You'll forgive me for leading you so soon. Ah. Uh. Sir, we beg you to help us all you can on her behalf. This match your father plans to make drives her each moment to despair. He's coming. Let us unite our efforts, we beg you, and try by strength or skill to change his purpose. So ho, I'm glad to find you all together. Now, Marianne, here is the contract that shall make you happy. Father, please, I beg you, in the name of heaven, do not make wretched this poor life you gave me. If you will not permit me to belong to one whom I have dared to love, at least, I beg you, save me from the torment of being possessed by one whom I abhor. Get on your feet. <laughs> the more you hate to have him, the more to help you earn your soul's salvation. So mortify your senses by this marriage, and don't vex me about it any longer. But what? Hold your tongue before your betters. If you would let me answer and advise. Brother, I value your advice most highly. Tis well thought out. No better can be had, so you'll allow me not to follow it. I can't find words to cope with such a case. Your blindness makes me quite astounded at you. You are bewitched with him to disbelieve the things we tell you happened here today. I wonder what your unbelief should answer if I should let you see we've told the truth. See it? Yes. Nonsense. I'm not proposing now that you believe us, but let's just say that here, from proper hiding, you are made to see and hear all plainly. What would you say then to your man of virtue? Why, then I'd say, say nothing, it can't be. Send him to me, and you, withdraw. This table, get under it. Why under there? Do as I say. I know what I am about, as you shall see. I am going a long way to humor you, but I'll see you through your scheme. Prepare yourself to be in no wise shocked. In order to prove to you his guilt, I am going to feign to share his love. And things shall go no further than you choose. So when you think things have gone quite far enough, it is for you to stop his mad pursuit. It is your own affair, and you must end it. He's coming. Hold still and don't show yourself. They told me you wished to see me here. Yes, I have secrets for your ear alone. But shut the door first and look everywhere for fear of spies. We surely can't afford another scene like that we had just now. Dami did frighten me most terribly. You saw I did my best to baffle his design, but I was so confused. I never thought to contradict his story. Still, thank heaven things turned out all the better. 
and we are on even safer footing now. Which is how I can be here, alone with you, with my heart perhaps too ready to allow your passion. Your words are somewhat hard to understand, madame. Just now you used a different style. If such a declaration has offended you, how little do you know a woman's heart? Should I have tried to keep dummy from speaking? Should I have sat and listened to the offer of your heart quietly as I did? Remember, if such a declaration had not pleased me? Tis past a doubt the height of happiness to hear such words from lips we dote upon. And yet, I well might think these words an honest trick to make me break off this approaching marriage. And, if I may express myself quite plainly, I cannot trust these two enchanting words until the granting of some little favor I sigh for shall assure me of their truth. What? <coughs> Must you go so fast and all at once exhaust the whole love of a woman's heart? She does herself the violence to make this dear confession to you, and you are not yet satisfied, and will not be without the granting of her utmost favors? I shall trust to nothing, madame, till you have convinced my love by something real. <coughs> but how can I consent to what you wish without offending the heaven you talk so much of? If heaven's now all that stands in my way, I'll easily remove that little hindrance. <coughs> Content my wishes, have no fear at all. I'll answer for it, and take the sin upon me. <coughs> your cough is very bad. Yes, I am in torture! In any case, your scruples easily removed. With me, you're sure of secrecy. There's no harm unless a thing is known. It's the public scandal that brings offense. And secret sinning is no sin at all. Ah, so then, I am resolved to yield, since more convincing proof is still demanded. If my consent give reason for offense so much worse for him who forced me to it, the fault can surely not be counted mine. It need not, madame. Open the door just to see whether or not my husband is there. Why take such care for him? Between ourselves, he is a man to lead around by the nose. I fooled him so he'd see all and deny it. No matter, go, I beg you. Look about and carefully examine every corner. I can't get over it. The whole thing floors me. What? You come out so soon you cannot mean it. Get back under the table. Wait until you are thoroughly convinced. All things conspire towards my satisfaction. Madame, I've searched the whole apartment through. There's no one here. And now my ravish. My holy man! Ah! You want to put it on me, eh? Marry my daughter and want my wife too! What? You believe it? Get out from here this instant and make no fuck about it! But my intent- Leave my house this instant! You're the one to leave it! You who plays the master here! This house belongs to me! You can't insult me at your pleasure! For I have the wherewith to confound your lies, avenge offended heaven, and compel those to repent who talk to me of leaving! <laughs> what sort of speech is this? What can it mean? This is no laughing matter. <laughs> In his words, I see my great mistake. The deed of gift is one thing troubles me. The deed of gift? You shall know all. For now, let's see if a certain box is still upstairs! I'm all wrought up about that wretched box. Above all else, it drives me to despair. This box must hide some mighty mystery. Argos, my friend who is in trouble, brought the box himself most secretly and left it with me. And on these documents, I hold his life and property depend. I went straight to my trader to confide in him, and his sophistry made me believe that I should get the box to him to keep, so that in case of search, I might deny my having it at all. Your case is bad, so far as I can see. This deed of gift, this trusting of the secret to him, 
were both steps that you took too lightly. He could lead you to any length with these for hostages. Father! Can the scoundrel threaten you, forget all the benefits received, and in his abominable pride, make of your very own arms against you? Too true, my son. It tortures me to think on. Let me alone. I'll chop his ears off for him! Spoke like a true young man. Now just calm down. Violets cannot advance our cause. What's this I hear of fearful mysteries? Strange things indeed from mine own eyes to witness. You see how I'm requited for my kindness? I zealously receive a wretched beggar. I lodge him, entertain him like my brother, give him my daughter, give him all my fortune, and he, meanwhile, the villain tries with black treason to suborn my wife and would make use of the advantages which my too foolish kindness armed him with to take my fortune away from me and leave me in the state I saved him from. Poor man. My son, I cannot possibly believe he can intend so black a deed. Mother, I saw with my own eyes his shamelessness. My dear, appearances are oft deceiving, and seeing shouldn't always be believing. How go mad? False suspicion may delude, and good to evil oft is misconstrued. <laughs> Should I construe with Christian charity to wish to kiss my wife? You must at least have just foundation for your accusing, and wait until you see a thing for sure. The devil! How can I see a thing for sure? Should I have waited till before my eyes? We're wasting time here in the merest trifling, which we should rather use to guard ourselves against this scoundrel's threats. I tell you, once again, armed as he is, you should have never pushed him quite so far. True, yet what could I do? The rascal's pride made me lose all control of my resentment. There is a man who comes with civil manners sent by Tartuffe, he says upon an errand that you'll be pleased with. Surely you must see him and find out who he is and what he wants. Perhaps he's come to make it up between us. How shall I treat him? You must not get angry, and if he talks of reconciliation, accept it. Sir, good day, and heaven send harm to your enemies, favor to you. My name is Loyal, my office is court bailiff, and I've come Sir, by your leave, to render a little summons. Order to vacate you and yours, this house, move all your furniture, make room for others, and without putting off or delay. Hi, huh? leave this house? Yes, please, sir. This house is now, as you well know, of course, Mr. Tartu. By virtue of a contract here attached. I shall suspend until tomorrow the execution of the order, sir. I'll quietly come here and spend the night with a half score of officers. But by tomorrow and at early morning, you must make haste to move your least belonging. I'd give this very minute, and not grudge it, the best hundred gold louis I have left. If I could just indulge myself and land my fist for one good square one on his snout! Calm down! Don't make things worse. Give us the paper and then leave us. Au revoir. Well, mother, am I right or am I not? Perhaps this writ may help you judge the matter yet, or do you not see its treason even still? I'm all amazed, befuddled and beflustered. You're quite wrong. You've no right to blame him. His action only proves his good intention, and love for his neighbor makes his virtue perfect. And knowing that money is a root of evil in Christian charity, he take away whatever may hinder your salvation. Be still. Go and expose his bold ingratitude. Such action must surely invalidate the contract. This with regret, sir, that I bring bad news. The villain who so long imposed upon you found means an hour ago to see the prince <gasps> and to accuse you, among other things, by putting in his hand the private strong box of a state criminal whose guilty secret you, he saved half half. Oh, that yes. same rascal comes with an officer who must arrest you. <gasps> this is how the scoundrel seeks to secure the property he claims. I have my carriage and, and a thousand Louis provided for your journey at the door. Let's lose no time. The boat is swift to strike, and such as only time can save you from. I'll be your guide to seek a place of safety and stay with you until you reach it, sir. How much I owe you for your obliging care. Goodbye. All of you. Come hurry. We'll see to everything that's needful, brother. Softly, <laughs> softly. Do not run so fast. By order of the prince, we here arrest you. <gasps> Ungrateful wretch, do you forget was I that saved you from utter misery? I've not forgot some help you may have given. But my first duty now is towards my prince. 
If the motive that you make parade of is as perfect as you say, why should it wait to show itself until the day he caught you soliciting his wife? Mm -hmm. How happens it you have not thought to go and form against him until his honor forces him to drive you out of his house? Pray, sir. Be good enough to carry out your order. Yes, it's very fitting you should urge me to it. I've too long delayed its execution. So therefore, you must follow me at once to prison where you'll find your lodging ready. Who? I, sir! You. Ah! 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 Why to prison? You are not the one whom I owe account. You, sir, recover from your hot alarm. Our prince is not a friend to double dealing. The art of hypocrites cannot deceive him. This fellow was by no means apt to fool him. He stood revealed before our monarch's eyes, a scoundrel known before by other names, whose horde of crimes, detailed at length, might fill a long-drawn history of many volumes. The papers which the traitor says are his, I am to take from him and give you back. The deed of gift, transferring your estate, our monarch sovereign will, makes null and void. Oh. And for the secret personal offense your friend who involves you in, he pardons you. Oh. Oh. Now heaven be praised! At last I breathe again! A happy outcome! Who'd have dared to hope it? Fair traitor, now you're- Brother, hold! And don't descend to such indignities, I beg you! to his unhappy fate, and let remorse oppress him, but not you. Hope rather that his heart may now return to virtue, hate his vice, reform his ways, and win the pardon of our glorious prince, while you must straightway go, and on your knees repay with thanks his noble, generous kindness. <laughs> well said. We'll go and at his feet kneel down with joy to thank him for his goodness shown. And this first duty done with honors due, we'll then attend upon another two. With wedded happiness award valet. <laughs> and crown a lover noble and sincere. Oh, yes.